Hi, I'm Crystal McDonough, and I am a business attorney. I'm first an entrepreneur. Uh, my first love is entrepreneur, it's business. I started my first business when I was 15. So I, I definitely love business. Um, business person first, attorney second. Uh, but it's wonderful because I get an opportunity to work with businesses and entrepreneurs to help them put plans together and, and look at their business from the perspective of what needs to happen to set them up uh, to mitigate risk and promote growth. Well, we're incredibly fortunate today. Thank you, Crystal, for being a guest today. This is Bob Rourke with Business Leaders Podcast. And I have Miranda Vieira. She's from Denver Legal Marketing. And we're going to do a co-hosted interview today. And so going through, Crystal, if you would, and it's Crystal McDonough from yes. McDonough Law Firm. Yes. And you just recently relocated to? Yes, we just moved from Greeley up to Granby, my hometown. I actually grew up in Grand Lake. My parents moved there when I was a year and a half. So I'm one of the very few people who get to say that they, they really did grow up in Grand Lake, went to high school at Middle Park, and graduated there. So it's really great. I get to go home and get to take my teenagers back, and, and they get to experience that same unique experience. Well, super. We're, what we're going to do, I think, is first off, Crystal, if you would, tell us about your practice and who you serve. So we are a general business practice, and we represent a lot of small to medium-sized companies and some larger companies and corporations as well. We do a lot of, of work with businesses, uh, anywhere from startup entrepreneurs to companies that are you know, in the middle of their, their growth and management all the way through sale, mergers, acquisitions. We, we do it all. You know, and when you look at that, your path to be an attorney mm -hmm. is a little different than perhaps some of your peers. Let's talk into a little bit yeah. about your journey to being an attorney. Well, I opened my first business when I was 15. Um, I opened a small piano studio and uh, had great success and really had a lot of fun. I can re still remember paying taxes on my first business at the age of 15. <laughs> um, my dad always wanted to make sure I paid my taxes, so learned that lesson. <laughs> um, and from there, I, I just, I love business. So I continued in several different areas of business. And as my family grew and as, you know, our needs and our wants changed, uh, explored different opportunities. And ultimately, after my third child was born, I decided I wanted to try my hand at something a little different, take the skills that I had, take the knowledge I had, and maybe use that in a different way. So I went to law school with three kids and a husband, and it was a challenge. It was definitely um, not for the faint of heart, let's say that. <laughs> so I did a, a master's degree and a Juris Doctor's degree at the same time. I was in a hurry to get it done because I had three kids and I didn't feel like I had time to waste. So I did both degrees in two and a half years. Uh, also worked as a law clerk for a local law firm. And I worked for the School of Energy Resources through a graduate assistantship program and worked with the state of Wyoming and the governor and the, le the state legislature. So Miranda, she's a classic underachiever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's slacking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think about that. So, all right, I'm going to pretend right now I'm your husband, right? Yeah. And, and I'm sitting there doing my day, and you come home mm -hmm. and say, honey, I think I want to go to law school and pick up my master's. And what yeah. was that like? So <laughs> that's about how it happened, actually. <laughs> I had decided or I, I, wanted, I was exploring some opportunities and some options, and I started a master's program at DU in environmental policy. And um, my first class was an energy law class, a global energy law taught by one of the law professors through the joint program at DU. I came home from my first night of that class and I told my husband, this is so cool. I have to go to law school. He said, I don't even know what that means. I said, well, neither do I. Let's figure it out. <laughs> so we did, we figured it out. I learned you had to take the SA, or the LSATs, which I wasn't super excited about, um, but I did. I took them. I applied for law school, and um, 
and, and here we are now. You know, <laughs> it, it, you know, shifting gears a little bit. So let's say that I'm a, a business owner, yeah. right? And I'm listening to this episode and I'm going like, geez, what does your ideal client look like? And do I fit that particular profile? Mm-hmm. So who's your ideal client? We work with a lot of entrepreneurs. We work with folks who are really excited about their business. They love what they do. They want to protect it. They want to make sure that that they have everything in place so that they can grow and that they can seed. Most of our clients are on their way up. They have big ideas, they have plans, they are excited about their future, and they want to know what can they do to help manage what they have, manage risk, manage uh, content, manage everyday, day-to-day activities, the annual activities, the 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 things that, that just business owners have to deal with uh, routinely, and how do they get that to a place where they can take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. And then we also have clients who have been very successful and are looking at selling. They're looking at the next step. Do they retire? Do they transfer their businesses to their children? Um, Do they sell their businesses to another company? Do they merge with another company for opportunities for further growth? We see that a lot where a company is looking at leveraging uh, their existing client base and looking to merge with another company in order to facilitate a greater growth and a greater a greater client presence. Well, you've seen that in your practice because you've scaled your practice as well, true? Yes, we have had tremendous growth. We are one of the fastest growing law firms in Northern Colorado. Excellent, so Mm -hmm. walk in the talk. (laughs) Yes. You know, we're we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. Uh, Typically, there's a series of questions I ask, but Mm -hmm. I thought we would try to tell, try to help the listeners out and and the clients and talk about specifics with what you bring to the table for business. So, you know, for some of the business owners that maybe have not used a business attorney before, Mm -hmm. you know, you hear, I have an attorney, and you go, well, what kind? You know, and so (laughs) a business attorney, you know, what about the range of things that you do to help a business owner? Mm -hmm. So if an existing business owner comes to us and says, I've I've been operating this business for a number of years, uh, what can you do to help us? The first thing that we're going to say is, is we'd like to take a look at all of your organizational documents. We want to see if you're a corporation, what are your articles of incorporation? What do your bylaws say? Um, have you been holding annual shareholder meetings? Have you been documenting those with minutes? Do you have resolutions that reflect all of the decisions that the corporation has been making? Do you have uh, minutes for your board of directors? Uh, those are the those are the first things that we're going to look at. We're going to look to see how the company is documenting legally what they're what they're doing, and the legal requirements on that are pretty clear. So we help walk them through that process. We analyze what they've been doing, and then we take a look at what holes there might be. And I like I like to describe it as a brick fence or a brick wall. So if you have a solid brick wall, you know nothing's going to get through that typically. Uh, Every piece that's missing, every, any document that's missing, if you don't have a bylaw, if you are missing uh, resolutions for decisions that the company's made that are big decisions, if you're missing annual meeting minutes, if you're not filing regularly with the Secretary of State, you know, there's a whole number of things beyond that that we, that we go to look at. Uh, your contracts, your subcontractors, your lease agreements, your vendor agreements. Uh, there's an entire host of documents that we, we look at. Every piece of those that are not being reviewed, looked at, updated, managed every year is like removing a brick from that fence. And if you remove enough bricks, that fence can fall. I'm going to be devil's advocate. Yeah. I'm going to say, well, I've got an LLC. I don't need any of that. Yeah. So that's exactly right. We hear that a lot. We, we hear it a lot. Do I sound like a client? <laughs> you know, so, you know, there's different types of formations. And when we work with startups, when, when we have a client that comes to us and says, I've got this great business idea, what do I do next? How do I, what's my next step? The first thing we're going to look at is what are your options for your organization? How are you going to form your organization? Are you going to be a corporation? Are you going to be a limited liability company? Are you going to be a partnership? Are you going to be a sole proprietorship? Those are the four main main organizational companies that we look at. And then we'll talk to them about what makes the most sense. What kind of company do they want to have? How many owners are there? 
How many managers? How many people are going to be working? How many employees are you going to have? Uh, do you have investors? We're going to ask them a lot of questions. Are you a franchise? Franchises are a whole different ball game, and they have a whole different set of things that need to be examined and looked at. Um, I had a franchise come to us uh, several years ago. I did a franchise sale, and you know we had a stack of documents this big. For, for you guys that are listening and not watching, that was like a foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the visual was a little out on the audio. There you go. <laughs> I like to talk with my hands. That's all right. <laughs> so, you know, so so when we ha- are working with a startup company, that's one of the things we're going to explore is what's the best organizational formation fit for you? And then we prepare the formation and the documents around exactly what your needs are. There is not a one size fits all. And that's a common mistake that we hear because, and you're going to see, you know, you can go online, you can Google, you can find a lot of different companies on the internet that will promise you they can form your company for you. There are business organization um, counselors or advisors that you can hire that are not lawyers, they're not CPAs, they're not financial advisors. So they're giving forms and information and telling you they can form your company, but that's all very legal and very critical for your company. I can't tell you the number of clients we have come to us with with those types of documents and we have to go back and fix them. And in some cases we have to just, it's a do-over because those companies aren't looking at that individual business's needs and who their clients are, what communities they work in, who their employees are, who their vendors are. There's a lot that goes into a business that um, a lot of folks don't think about. And I think that's why we're so unique, because I'm an entrepreneur first. I've owned and operated several really fun companies, and and I've loved every minute of it. And I've also helped my husband manage his companies. And that's all before law school. So I bring a really unique perspective to this because I understand business. I understand the things that the business owners have going through their head. Most of the time, business owners are more worried about, OK, can I bring in the clients? Can I meet payroll? Can I pay my taxes? Mm-hmm. You know, Can I afford the insurance? These are really just day-to-day practical things. We're here to help take the headache off of managing the legal side of their company so that they can focus on growing their business, making money, and doing what they love. Miranda? Yeah, I, I see a lot of, of proactive action is what you're, what mm-hmm. you're describing here, um, where you, you see the holes and you help them fill them. Um, can you explain a little bit more about why it's an economical choice to hire the lawyer before you get sued Mm -hmm. or before you go to sell um, your business or merge it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So in the various different types of organizations you can have as a company, if you whether you're a corporation or an LLC, uh, what we like to do, and and there's business requirements for both, by the way. So if you're a corporation, you know, there's a there's a, a group of statutes that govern what corporations can and cannot do, how they have to be organized, how they have to be run. There's also statutes and the rules and laws in Colorado for limited liability companies and how they need to be run, managed, what they can and can't do. And so one of the things that we like to do with companies is to make them aware of what their responsibilities are as a business owner, as a member, as a shareholder, as a director, whatever their title is, whether they're president, vice president, um, if you're an LLC, you're a member, owner, manager, and there's requirements. So what we like to do is is make sure that those companies understand those requirements and help them follow those so that we can help to mitigate any risks down the road from uh, potential issues from shareholder disputes, um, member manager disputes, employee disputes, um, issues where there's breaches of contract or, um, you know, I mean, really there's, we see a lot, you know, and we do litigation for businesses. And so we get to see the good, bad, and the ugly. And once we get to litigation, it's too late because at that point, the mistakes are already there. And at that point, you're just trying to get them through with as little damage as possible. You know, that's, that's pretty good segue. You know, I think for the business owner that's listening, he's going like, holy cow. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a large dinner to eat in one bite. Yeah. You know, and then the thing I think that perhaps is 
misunderstood is how to be proactive as a business owner mm -hmm. with a business attorney. And perhaps it would be good for you to touch on advice you might have on taking care of this stuff before versus after. Mm -hmm. So I think for somebody who's looking to start up a brand new company, the first thing that they need to do, they need to get their attorney, their CPA or financial advisor, and their insurance advisor. Those three professionals are going to be your partners in your business, and they're going to be there to help you every step of the way. And you work with them to make sure that you're getting all of your documents in place. You essentially you want to dot every I and cross every T in business. And if you start that way, then you get off to a great foot, and then it's about managing every year, every month, as things come up. And, and quite frankly, if you set it up that way, you don't need attorneys every day. You don't need attorneys every month. You may have questions that come up once in a while, contracts that might need to be reviewed, um, employee agreements that might need to be changed. There might be a change in the law that might affect your business, and so we might need to come in and review some things with you. But if you set it up that way from the beginning, then your costs and the time that you need from an attorney or a legal advisor is going to be minimal. It's going to be very manageable. If you already own a business, and it's been several years, and maybe you've never paid attention to these things, then you need to consider what's been done. You need to have us come in and take a look at your documents. And what do we need to make sure that we can get everything in a row now? We, we never know what's going to happen. And I'm not trying to scare anybody <laughs> by any means, because we never wish anything bad on in, any companies. But we've seen partnerships go sour. We've seen vendors who you know there's a disagreement with the contract and there's an issue how do we handle this you know in the service industry when you're providing a service which by the way lawyers are lawyers are providing a service um, but we've seen you know in the service industry you may have some complaints about the way the service was handled so those are the kinds of things we like to come in and make sure that we can get your your ducks in a row now before something like that happens so that if something like that comes up you're prepared and instead of having to play catch up and play defense after the fact you can be more proactive get your ducks in a row get everything in place now so that if or when something happens like that then you're prepared and you know what to do and you know how to handle it and you have something in place so for that business owner that's going like yep that's what i need right? yeah and it says i need to reach out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um First off, how do they find you? What's, where do they find you on social media? So you can find us on our website at www.McDonaughLawLLC.com. It's D-O-N-O-U-G-H. Yes. It sounds it, like McDonough. MC. Yeah, <laughs> yeah MC. MC. It sounds like McDonough-Hugh, mm -hmm. but it's pronounced McDonough. Okay. McDonough. <laughs> Blame my husband's family. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. I know. You, you know, so back to the business owner. So I go, you know, I need to do this. Mm -hmm. So they reach out to you, mm -hmm. and you or somebody from your firm walks through the door. Mm -hmm. What should they expect, either time frame or what they should, you know, what does that feel like mm -hmm. or look like for them? So for companies that are looking for us to help them with, with their existing their existing business, and they, they call us and say, okay, I need some I re need some risk management. I need someone to come in and take a look at everything, see if we're doing something right or not. For those kinds of companies, we offer a free one-hour in-house consultation. We will come to you because most of the time your business, you, you've got file cabinets, you've got things spread out, you might have some things online, you might have papers here and there. And so we'll come to you, we'll give you a free one-hour consultation, and we'll help walk through what do you have, what are you missing, let's take a look at what what you might need and then from there uh, you know if, if they decide they want to hire us then we'll enter an engagement agreement with them and we'll work with them to come up with a plan to make any corrections that need to be made update things that need to be updated and then put together a plan to move forward so that they don't have to ever be worried again I talked to a client last week that we we did this with and she said oh good I can sleep at night now I don't need to be worried about my business because I know you've got it handled. And that's exactly it. That's what we're here for. We're here to handle all of that so that the business owner can rest easy knowing that these things are being looked at, managed, taken care of, and they can go do what they love. You know, 
with Miranda and Denver Legal Marketing and what you do, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think in many cases the general public and business owners in particular have no idea really what a business attorney does, you know, and, <laughs> until they have to go find one. Right. You know, and so I don't think they necessarily see the proactive differentiation. Mm-hmm. You know, we see the attorneys on the TV channels at night going, if you get run over by a bus, call me, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So, Miranda, when you're trying to get the word out to the business community about what she does, what are the types of things that that Denver Legal Marketing brings to the table in working with McDonald Law Firm? So I think the first thing to really impress on everyone is that you have choices when it comes to the type of lawyer that you have, the type of law firm that you uh, choose to engage. There are thousands of lawyers in Colorado and Wyoming, and so you can like your lawyer. You can uh, respect your lawyer. You can get to know them, uh, and that's a big part of it is having a connection with somebody, knowing that they're there to protect your business proactively. They are... Uh, working on things that you don't necessarily know. I mean, it's important to hire people that know what you don't, and that's Mm -hmm. one of the big areas when it comes to corporate and kind of business law in general. You just cannot know everything. Um, And then, you know, the the second one would, the second area would kind of be just bedside manner, that um, exactly what Crystal's describing, of going into businesses and doing audits, and I think you had a term of stress test something like that business or uh, bank stress test um, doing doing those types of kind of proactive services for free mm-hmm. initially is not common mm-hmm. not in Colorado and really not anywhere mm-hmm. uh, and it shows the level of care and concern from day one of working with Crystal's um, corporate law firm that that just makes it different and what I think is neat is this applies to all industries it's not just to um, you know, just oil and gas. You also work with real estate attorney. You know, real estate uh, professionals. You mm-hmm. have lots of different industries that that this really does help mm-hmm. and and really just uh, augments what they're already doing and makes it better, not just bigger. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. You know, and one of the things that struck me is you know there's this flood of information that comes out in in these episodes and and as the business owner you're going to go you know I'm capable of latching on to one or two of them. So if there was the top one or two things that you would have a business owner take away from here that they should do and mm-hmm. put it on their calendar to get done in the next 90 days, what would they be? I think the first thing would be to call us and have us come in for your free one-hour consultation to take a look at what you have. It's free, and there's no risk for you. It doesn't cost you anything. That's the first thing you need to do. You need to take a look at it, and I love the term stress test because we need to look at this and say, okay, where's your areas of weakness and what do we need to do or what can we do to help? So I think that's the number one thing that any business owner should be, should be doing really. And you know, this is, we're in spring, we're still, uh, the year is still young. I think it should, be, it should be the number one thing that everybody does. And then the second thing would be take that information and then look at what is important to you in your business. And and we, you know, we work with businesses to determine if we find in particular areas where there's uh, some weakness or some things that need to be fixed, we can prioritize. So we'll work with each individual company from that point to prior- make a priority list. If there's things that need to be done, some of them might be urgent. Some of them might be things that could be done over the course of a year. Some of them might be things that they would want to think of for maybe the following year. So we help the business to prioritize what needs to be done and when, and and that would be step two. You know, one of the things that strikes me about what we're talking about is many of the business owners go just more legal work, more expense, yeah. and so on. I don't think they fully appreciate the value of having this in place um, to the potential valuation of their business, or if a buyer mm-hmm. shows up out of the blue, and you know. The, maybe you contrast the difference between when the paperwork's done and a buyer shows up and when the paperwork isn't done Mm -hmm. and the buyer shows up. And we've been in both situations with our clients where clients have had their ducks in a row, the paperwork's been done, everything is is where in place and where it needs to be. The buyer shows up and you know they're doing their due diligence. Our role in that is minimal then. Our cost and our, our activities are 
are minimal. At that point, we're assisting with negotiations or we are assisting with contract review, making sure that these purchase sale agreements um, are are in our you know that that matches what our clients want. That we're negotiating the terms that our clients want us to negotiate. It's minimal at that point, uh, and it's a matter of and when when those things are in place, the d- paperwork's in place. It's easy for us. We're a modern law firm, so we hold all of our client documents in the cloud in a very secure uh, location. It's easy for us to click a button and say, "All right, here's the due diligence documents." That's a matter of hours putting those together versus a buyer coming in where those documents haven't been paid attention to, and then all of a sudden we're having to go back and figure out, okay, what's missing? What has to be done? What's critical for the sale? What is the buyer going to require? And I will tell you that in some cases, buyers have walked away because there's too much risk. When a buyer is looking at a company, they are analyzing the risk of that company and they're going to do a cost benefit analysis of that company and if the risk is too high they'll walk because there's not enough potential benefit and sometimes we'll see cases where the buyer says okay we're going to buy it but it's going to affect the price that's also possible and in other cases we've seen buyers say all right get your hands dirty it's going to cost you some money we want this done you get it done when you get it done, then we can finalize and work on the sale. And we've been in all situations where we've had to do all of that. You know, it's doing the preparation is, just, is frankly just good business. It is. It's just good business. Yeah. You know, so you know, shift going further down the road. <laughs> yeah. Right? So your area of focus is northern Colorado, Denver, kind of on the border of Wyoming. Mm-hmm. What are what are the issues that you see those business owners facing, um, kind of currently and in the future? Well, you know, our primary focus area has been northern Colorado, but I will just say that we have been expanding greatly. We are actually now, all, we represent clients throughout all of Colorado. Uh, this summer we opened our office in Lakewood, and so we are expanding and representing clients all throughout Denver now. We're very excited about that. And we are representing businesses in Wyoming, Nebraska, and California now. I was going to say, you're hitting all the garden spots. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Wyoming, Nebraska, I'm liking it. There's some beautiful country. There's a lot of it. A lot of it. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things that, that we find, the challenges that, that the businesses are, are facing in northern Colorado and Denver and really a lot of the places that we operate is the economy is good. And you would think that that's not a problem. But... It is. It becomes a problem for businesses to manage the growth. It becomes a problem for businesses to manage the paperwork side of their company, because people, you know, a business might get a vendor contract rather than having their attorney double check it, make sure that there's nothing in there that's a red flag or could potentially harm their company. You know, businesses are just they're in a hurry. Just sign it, get it done. We've got work we have to get done. Uh, they're hiring employees. They're hiring subcontractors, and they may not be properly putting into place employee agreements. They may not properly be putting together those subcontractor agreements. We're seeing a lot of handshake deals right now, which when you're in a hurry, I get it. You just want you just want people to come in to get the work done. But when you do that, you're potentially putting your business at risk. Those are of concern. Lease agreements. You wouldn't think that lease agreements would be something you really should care about. And we hear all the time, our clients tell us all the time, well, I didn't think I could negotiate it. And they're just signing on the dotted line. And then they're coming to us when a problem arises. And, you know, we're we're having to work through that problem with them and and try to to mitigate some of the issues. So, you know, that's one of the, when, when you're in a good economy, the problem is managing that growth and then slowing down and taking enough time to make sure that you are checking every contract that you are getting those employee and, and vendor and subcontractor agreements in place and review those leases because they can come back to bite you. <laughs> so those and even internal policies. Internal policies, know, yeah. I think can be a rabbit hole of, mm-hmm. <laughs> of litigation, you know, that need to I would say maybe mm-hmm. look, be looked at yearly. I mean it's just absolutely a health check. absolutely. Well and it depends on the industry too. For example, if you were a real estate company and we represent a lot of real estate companies in Colorado. 
if you're a real estate company, you know, a lot of those real estate rules and regulations are updated every year. If you are not updating your contracts every year, then you're potentially putting yourself and your clients at risk. You know, that's a that's a big thing to know. Laws change. You know, we're hearing a lot in the news right now uh, about laws changing. They change every year. There are lawsuits every year. And when those lawsuits are decided and, and judges determine the outcomes of some of those cases, sometimes that can impact your business and you may not know it. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that we monitor and we work with our clients on is what are the issues we need to be aware of. Uh, and in particular for our real estate clients, this is a big deal. Um, there was a huge overhaul on the rules uh, about a year, well, a little over a year ago that went into effect January 1 of 18, 2018. And so for every single one of our real estate clients, we spent a lot of time going through every single contract. We had to revise everything. It was a big chunk of work. But once they were done, they had it. And they had it in place. And they were good to go with all of their clients, all their deals, all their purchase sale agreements, all their rental agreements, all their property management agreements for the rest of the year. It's one and done. Yeah, I think that, that a lot of people don't understand the proactive nature of using mm -hmm. uh, a business attorney. I just, I, my husband and I own four businesses, and we are constantly looking at this stuff, you know, from that 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 risk perspective of, of we just don't know enough. Mm -hmm. And so we have to hire people that, that do know, you know, that the different areas of the law, there are just so many holes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I keep thinking of the potential business buyer. Yeah. That when he walks into a company and says, our policies and procedure are established where we do an annual review. Mm -hmm. We have our contracts updated. You know, we just completed this here recently. It's just part of what we do all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, and as a business purchaser, I'm going to go, that's refreshing. <laughs> you, you know, and, right. and so you can look at the business as less of a, an unknown, perhaps, on what's going to get me when I buy this that I don't see. Right. You know, and one of the areas that, that I see here is a top women in energy. <laughs> and thinking about, you know, the, the various facets of your business. Yeah. You know, so when you're functioning as outside counsel for an energy company, mm -hmm. all right, what does that look like? What does it entail? So our work in energy is really unique, um, very unique. So I grew up, I grew up with in Granby, Grand Lake. My dad worked for Northern Colorado Water District while I was growing up on the Western Slope. So I got a, a really, really good understanding growing up of what, um, what the energy picture looks like because you have the hydro dams and you've got a lot of energy that comes off the Colorado River. And my dad always made a point to help us to understand that and, and see that, that big picture of how our natural resources play into our energy picture. And then my grandfather owned uh, a legacy farm outside of Kimball, Nebraska, and it was great. We got to go there every summer, winter. We were there all the time. And my, my grandpa was one of the lucky ones that also owned his mineral rights along with his surface. And he had oil all over that farm. And as a kid, I was one of the only ones that took an interest in in that operation and he would drive me around those oil roads for hours and he would talk about each well, how much was in production, what, uh, what they were looking at, you know, how much it cost to drill, uh, what the royalties were. He would show me his leases and go through those leases with me. It was probably a unique, <laughs> unique situation for a kid. To grow in. So I took a lot of that, that love of, of our surroundings, of our natural resources and seeing it done in a really positive way and taking my business background and the things that I, I've learned and, and done along the way with me into law school. And when I was in law school, I had the privilege to work with the state legislature to draft the Wind Energy Property Rights Act. And I had the opportunity to work with uh, the Judiciary Committee on some, some other laws related to land use and wind energy. So I've really had some unique opportunities to see firsthand and to be involved in things that not many folks get to see and understand. And as part of my master's degree, my master's degree is in natural resources, I had an opportunity to travel 
the entire state of Wyoming and visit every form of energy production in Wyoming. So I got to see coal bed methane production. I got to see huge open pit mines. I got to go down in the mines. I got to see uranium production. I got to see, I got to see how water is, frack water is processed and cleaned. And I got to actually look at, at that, that entire process. I got to visit, I get to visit wind farms all the time, which is kind of fun. <laughs> and solar farms. I, I've had this really amazing experience to see and be a part of the energy picture and how, how working with our natural resources looks. And then combining that with my business background, I'm able to take a look at the unique aspects of what happens in, an, in energy and apply my business knowledge to that. Because energy companies, whether you're solar, wind, uh, oil and gas, or, or any other type of, of company, you have a unique aspect to your business that most business owners don't have. You have an entire regulatory framework that you have to work within. You've got federal and state requirements and filing requirements you have to do. You've got, you have to work with stakeholders on a daily basis, including your local city governments, your county governments, your state, and with your shareholders. So you have a lot of things that you've got to work on. And so your legal, your legal needs are very different. And we also work in the utility space and in the utility in industry. We do a lot of utility work. And um, that's a completely different business animal. Uh, utility work, you know, your contracts. When you're talking in, in the business side of energy, you're talking about extremely complex contracts. And, you know, we understand that. We understand what goes into those. We understand uh, the nature on how that works. A lot of business attorneys don't understand that. You know, one of the things that I, I meant to say at the beginning, and I'll say now, <laughs> is that this is obviously um, not legal advice anywhere through no. this episode. And if you have a specific question, either reach out to you or your counsel to get specific advice on your specific challenge or issue. So. Uh, with that being said, <laughs> typical disclaimer yeah. on on advice. <clears throat> you know, as you, as you look forward in in your firm, mm -hmm. what do you see coming for your firm? We're really excited about the growth that we have at our firm. We love our clients. We've got great clients, and I think that that shows. And I think that's why we're growing so much because we really do uh, give our clients a lot of hands-on personal experience and. I'm excited. We're look, we've we've our law clerk just accepted uh, our offer to join us as an associate once he passes the bar. So we're really excited about that, and we're looking at expanding into some other states and some other areas. Um, I'm I'm really excited about the possibility of that. Uh, we're we're just so blessed to be able to work in the space we do with the clients that we get to work with every day. And I don't think that there's very many people that get to say that. When they get up every morning, it might be hard work, but it's good work and they love what they do. And that's me. I love what I do. I love what we are doing. I love how we're growing. I, I like that we are a modern law firm that is looking at doing law a little differently than it's been done traditionally. We, we have a lean space so that we can keep our rates uh, at a at a very fair price for our clients. We run everything through the cloud. We're a paperless company, which really reduces costs for us that we pass on to our clients. And it's it's a great win win for everybody. And you know it, it's it's a we have fun going to work every day. <laughs> you know it, it, the thing that strikes me is you know past just the topic of law. Mm -hmm. All right, you have a growing business. Yeah. And so you're charged with hiring, retaining, motivating, <laughs> doing all of the things that you talk about. Mm -hmm. So for you, when you get up for a day, what are the rituals that you do or the, the, the routine that you might offer as advice to perhaps another young attorney or a young woman getting ready to start a business? What would you offer? I start my day and I end my day. By the way, my days are very long. <laughs> <laughs> With three kids, you're outnumbered, period. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I, I start my day and I end my day going through my task list. And I'm, that, that's just what I do every day. And I look at what are the things that need to get done today. And I have, I have two lists. One is what do I need to make sure I'm completing for my clients today? The other list is what are the things that I need to complete for my business today? And what needs to be managed on my business side? And I typically, I do, I have two equal lists. And, you know, I, I have to split my day between those. And, and which is why my day is so long. <laughs> I think it's neat to see... I think it's neat to see Crystal uh, being a mom, being a business owner, mm -hmm. being a really successful lawyer, kind of proving that you can have it all, maybe not just a, maybe not in one day, but you mm -hmm. can do it all and you can be successful at it yeah. and happy. Um, and I think that happy, productive lawyers are really one of the better choices mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, figuring out who's going to protect your business. Mm -hmm. You know, it's somebody that wants to be there, somebody that smiles when they talk about their clients, you know, just the same way that Crystal's face lit up when she was talking about how of service she is, mm -hmm. you know, to the business community. So mm -hmm. it's neat to see. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about your day. I, I have a couple of kids, but mine are out of the house now. <laughs> you know, and, and the, the demands of, of yeah. customers and mm -hmm. then the demands of just the business itself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as, as you work through, one of the areas that I – you know, we talked about a little bit beforehand is when you get involved uh, with businesses, either uh, late stage businesses, and you look at business tran transition, where they're trying to get the business to their kids mm -hmm. or trying to get their business uh, to an outside buyer. Mm -hmm. What are the top one or two things you say those particular businesses should have in place mm -hmm. before they embark on that particular journey? So what we're talking about is business succession planning. That's really what we're talking about. And that, that needs to mirror, you know, if you own your business and, or whether you own a part of your business or percentage, you need to be looking at your business as part of your succession planning, your trust, your estate, how you want to pass that, that on. And we take a look at what are your goals, what, where's your company at? And if you want to bring your kids in, a lot of times we recommend that you have everything in place beforehand so that they're not coming in with unrealistic expectations or with a an, with misunderstanding because the last thing and we, we've seen too many businesses torn apart because of families disagreements misunderstandings you know we love each other and we're family but as soon as you become business partners it changes the relationship you know you, you know the, the saying that great fences make great neighbors I like to say that good <laughs> contracts make good partners. If you can, if you are going to, whether you're working on planning on succeeding your business to your child or whether you're bringing in another business partner, you need to make sure that you have those contracts in place. And what we usually we want to do a solid buy-sell agreement that outlines exactly what happens. And in the, if we're working with business owners who have a substantial uh, ownership interest in a company. We also then like to work with that individual on their personal estate planning to make sure that those mirror and that they match. You don't want those conflicting with each other because that can create problems for your kids down the road. And that's the last thing we want to do. You know, for, for the business owner that has kids maybe are not ready for prime time, mm -hmm. not yet, mm -hmm. but they want to bring them on board of the company and start trying to get them trained up for lack of a better term mm -hmm. all right what advice might you offer to that business owner so it depends on what that owner wants to do and so there are some options they can bring their child in as an employee and start learning the ropes they can start learning the business we don't usually recommend that you bring in a uh, one of your children uh, adult or otherwise that may not have any understanding of the business because that can possibly create some tensions and some liabilities for the company. So if you can bring your kids into the business and let them learn the ropes, let them get a sense of, of how things work, we work with uh, a couple of companies that have done this and we've really gotten to see firsthand how beneficial it is to have those kids come in as young adults. Sometimes they're working in there when they're teenagers and they start working in there. Sometimes they come in out of college. 
we've we've seen a couple of businesses that have brought those kids in and they've actually had them work in all the various departments in the company so that they can learn those before they ever become an owner. And there's a lot of really creative things that we can do if you need to bring them in as an owner for a particular reason sooner than later. There's things that we can we can put in place in your buy-sell agreements and in some of the, the bylaws or the operating agreements if you're an LLC or bylaws if you're a corporation that can spell out what that those responsibilities are and how um, how the this the son or daughter needs to work within the framework of the company to learn the ropes before they get more access to the financial side of the company or to making business decisions. Um, You know, those are, those are really big things for anyone to come in if they don't know how to run a business. And so we always like to put some language in place in your business documents to help manage a little bit of that. But it's really individual and it's very specific. It depends on the type of business, depends on the relationship you have with your kids, depends on what your goals are and where you're at in your life. Um, You know, when we have clients that come to us and they're, you know, maybe there's a health reason and they have to bring in someone, then we're going to approach it very differently from somebody who's looking at retiring in 10 years and they want to bring their son or daughter in to teach and train them to take over the company. We're going to pretend for a moment. (laughs) We're going to pretend that I'm a a seasoned business owner. Mm -hmm. And within the past two years, I've gone through an entire process, I believe fairly exhaustive, on doing all of my de-risking, business planning, and so Mm -hmm. on. And let's say you're chatting to me, this pretend (laughs) squared away business owner. Okay. And, (laughs) yeah, you know, and, and the thing that's interesting I think, is what might you say to them about doing a cross-check or a review Mm -hmm. or it says, is this really going to do what you think it's going to do? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Basic, we talked about that, Mm -hmm. you know, stress test, Mm because what we didn't talk about is some of the other protections that businesses have. You know, whether it's the the insurance contracts Mm -hmm. and others, what other things might you do for that squared away business owner? (laughs) For that squared away business owner, I think what we would want to do is we would, you know, one of the things we'd want to do is just review the documents and confirm that it's done completely as he or she believes it is. And we would want to coordinate with their CPA or financial advisor and their insurance agent to make sure that those aspects of the business match what has been done. We would also want to look at your personal estate planning. Because one of the things that we see all the time is, you know, if we have a client that says, I, I'm good, I'm, I, I feel really good about it, I feel <laughs> really comfortable about this, um, yeah. a lot of times, they, they might forget that, you know, maybe they haven't had their CPA talk to their lawyer. Maybe their insurance agent hasn't talked to their lawyer. We, we think that all three of those advisors need to be in communication. We work with all of them because if you're not, it's easy to, to miss something. The, the financial advisor might say, okay, we want to set, set this up this way. But if that decision, and, and that, so, so that duck might be in a row on that side, but if that isn't reflected in the business documents properly, it might be reflected on the IRS side. Mm-hmm. But if it's not reflected on the business document side, that creates a problem potentially. Same thing with your insurance. If your insurance isn't matching what's reflected um, from the advice of your CPA or in your business documents, that could so so you certainly could have everything in a, everything done. You could feel like it's all buttoned up in a nice neat bow and. You could have all your insurance done, you could have all your financial advising done, and you could have your legal stuff done. But if you're not looking at it in a coordinated effort to make sure that it all matches and it all works together, then there could be an issue. The other thing is, and I really I can't emphasize this enough, your estate planning needs to be reflected. It needs, it needs to be coordinated. Your personal estate planning needs to reflect what's being done in your business and what those decisions are for your business because if you don't then it could be all nice and buttoned up for you during your lifetime and you may not have any problems but if it's not been reflected properly in your estate documents 
your children or your heirs may have a mess to clean up. And that's the last thing you want to do is leave your children a mess. And we've seen those too and had to work through those as well. And I've had, I've had some clients just come to us in tears. Dad said he had it all done. He said that this was all, you know, this was here, this was here, this was here. Well, yeah, he did have it done. And it was just like he said, but he forgot to have the financial advisor work with the lawyer. In fact, we had that exact situation happen um, a couple years ago. And because of that, the trust that had been set up only worked for 90% of the assets. We ended up having to go through a lengthy probate. It took about a year because one financial advisor didn't get talked to. There was no coordination between the lawyer and the financial advisor, and it created a problem. Now, we were able to work through it. We were able to go through that process, but it ended up costing them a lot of attorney's fees that they could have avoided and a lot of headache. And and we've also seen it on the flip side where we have clients come to us where dad had a business and he did do it right. And the clients came to us. We just had to help them manage the, the process of transferring the estate property to the beneficiaries. And, and they were just so grateful that dad had done that. And it was, they, were, they were so relieved that it wasn't going to cost them a lot of money. And even though it was going to take a little time to transfer the assets, that it was going to be done without a lot of headache and without any fighting without any craziness. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we see we see both ways. I think it's neat to just stress the experience, how, how much that matters when you're selecting a business attorney where they can mm -hmm. see you around the corner, kind of, when you can't, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're not cutting their teeth on your case, you know, they know what they're doing. You know, yeah. it's, it, it strikes me as, you know, many folks are pretty emotional about what's going on at the time when they run into a problem. Yeah. And it's really hard to, to divorce away the emotion from the business decision yeah. and it's nice to have an objective coach mm -hmm. to come on board. I saw a statistic recently mm -hmm. that talked about net worth and for business owners 80% plus of their net worth is tied up in their business mm -hmm. and in the stress test where we've talked about a couple of times family offices, high net worth family offices, mm -hmm. 90 plus percent of them get second opinions on all of their work. Yeah and they should. I think it's a great advice to do that and and you know, that gives them that extra peace of mind to know that it's being done, it's being done right. And, you know, I, I just, I think that anything that you can do to protect your business, I mean, this is your life's work in some cases. You've poured your heart and soul, your blood, sweat and tears, all of your money, your time, you know, the time that you've spent away from your family. I mean, you, you're right. You, families, families pay the price when you're building a company like this. And the last thing you want to do is find out after the fact that, man, if we would have just had a double check, if we would have just had a second look. And, you know, and it might not be that anybody made a mistake. And often it's, it's not that someone is intentionally making a mistake on something. It could just be that maybe a document, maybe you forgot about a document. Or it was not signed. It was done, not signed. And, oh, we see that. And that's, that's unfortunate. You know, in some cases, in some cases, you know, clients will, they'll do the right thing. They'll work with lawyers and they'll have documents drafted up, but they're just so busy. They forget to get it signed or, you know, and we've had, we've seen situations where, you know, there's been a flood or fire or some sort of loss, theft. Sometimes those business documents are gone. And if you're not keeping them in in a secure I mean you can keep them in a secure space in your office but if you only have hard copies and you don't have an electronic copy kept somewhere um, well I think about the flooding in Nebraska right now oh yeah can you imagine how many farm records are gone oh yeah and you know then that brings up a good point you know a lot of family farms and ranches nowadays are not owned by grandpa grandma or mom or dad they're now put into a corporation or an LLC so, and we work with a lot of farms and ranches and their companies, and, and that's exactly right. I, I had a client that brought me a stack of grandpa's documents from the farm business, and, and, liter and he kept it all in a secure safe. He actually had three of them, three secure safes in, in the basement. And, you know, if, if a flood had hit that particular house, 
they would have been ruined. They would have been wiped away. And but as it was, you know, we they were the family was able to bring them to us. We actually scanned every single document that comes in our door because we're a paperless office, so that we ensure that your records are safe. They are secure. They're electronic. If you call us up and say, oh, my gosh, do you have that lease? I can't find it. Yep, we've got it. I'll get it to you. Take take me about 30 seconds. You know, so, you know, that's one of the things that I think that that businesses need to think about is is protecting those documents, because even even if you did it right and you've got it done, what happens if you lose them? Yeah, we don't have any weather events out here anyways. No floods, no, no. tornadoes, <laughs> no, no fire. no. <laughs> No, <laughs> I'm missing frogs and locusts. That's about it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times my house in Greeley got uh, hail. You know, and how many roofs we've had to put on. And oh, that's crazy. It is. It is crazy. It is. Miranda, what am I missing that I should ask? You know, I think we've covered it all. I think uh, the big thing here is is the importance of hiring somebody, even if you don't feel like you have enough work for a lawyer to hire them full time. Mm -hmm. You know, an outside general counsel type of position mm -hmm. uh, or engagement really works well for small to medium sized mm -hmm. businesses um, Colorado Nebraska Wyoming everyone needs this it isn't really a location based thing it's mm -hmm. more of a uh, a general service that business owners proactively need mm -hmm. at least proactive business owners would go well for. and you bring up a good point you know outside general counsel I mean we we do that for a lot of our businesses and they like that. They like knowing that they can pick up the phone anytime. And, you know, I give my clients my cell phone number so they can always reach me. You know, I mean, that, that's how we are. They can call me and they can say, you know, I've got a question. Uh, what should I do about this? And, and sometimes I get questions from clients. They'll call me and, and they'll just need to talk about some of the issues. And I think that that brings up the point of, you know, we're first and foremost counselors. The lawyer is a counselor. You know, you hear all the time, counselor at law. There's a reason that that's the title that's been given to lawyers, because we're here, we're advisors. We're there to listen, understand what's going on. In some cases, you know, a business owner just needs to talk to another business owner about what's going on in their company. And and we're pretty safe, because if, if you're our client, you know, we have attorney-client confidentiality, plus I'm a business owner. I'm also an entrepreneur, so I get it. I get it when it's a hard day. I get it when you find out that you have an employee that took trade secrets. That's not going to be fun to deal with. So you just need to vent a little bit, and then we need to figure out what the next step is. You know, these, those are the kinds of things. I, you know, I even had, I have clients call for really odd things sometimes. You don't even, you know, they don't even know. You, you, yeah. There's just really things come up in business, and you need to know you've got someone to call. Because as a business owner, a lot of times you don't want to go talk to your neighbor. You know, you're not going to go talk to your employees. You need to know you've got someone safe. And that's me. Yeah. You know, I, I, what I typically get is the health question. They'll have a health event. Uh -huh. And I go, I don't do health, but I talk a lot about health issues because mm -hmm. it affects everything else they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would tell you, Crystal, we have worn you out. <laughs> and it's been a real pleasure. You know, and, and part of it is, you know, the, the knowledge that you share and the other part is your passion for what you do and in the business and helping the business community. And Miranda, thank you so much for Bye. being on here co-hosting with us today. And Crystal, we look forward to great things in the future from you. Thank you. You bet.